Okay, we are dealing now with liquids. So we talked about matter, which is basically combinations, for instance, of atoms. If the atoms are holding hands tightly, then you create a solid. If they're holding hands kind of loosely, you end up with a liquid. If they're not holding hands at all, the molecules are not holding hands at all, you end up with a gas. Then if you heat the gas up even further, what happens is the atoms give up their electrons. So the electrons start whizzing off, and the atoms are then charged. So I would become a positive atom, I've given up my electron, the electron is whizzing around negatively. So if you put this plasma, you now get a plasma, the gas where the electrons have left the atoms, so that the atoms are charged, can now be influenced by an electric field or a magnetic field if the atoms are moving. So that is a plasma, which is basically a gas, but it's charged, and so it behaves differently. Cool? So lightning, you end up with plasmas in lightning. You end up in plasmas with uh, different kinds of lighting as well, like sun. neon lighting. Sorry? Sun plasma. Sun Is the sun plasma? Extra credit to the question. Uh, yes, it should be. Because this, the sun's temperature is so hot, so high, that, uh, I don't know, the uh, surface of the sun is about 5,000 degrees centigrade ballpark, right? The center of the sun is probably millions of degrees centigrade. And um, I would guess that that should be hot enough to ionize the gases. But look it up, let me know if I'm wrong, right? But extra credit anyway. Oh, you've just got one to go. Oh, I had the one scaly the moment ago. Oh, you did? Perfect. Oh, here's another extra credit for you, just to make you feel good, right? Okay, so dealing with liquids now. We all know what a liquid is, right? Like water or alcohol or whatever, right? Whatever it is, your favorite. Uh, no? Okay. So, a few things dealing with liquid. First, pressure, right? So, if this were a swimming pool and if you were to swim near the bottom of the pool, right, if you go down to the bottom of the pool, the, you, the pressure on you increases. Now, with typical pools, you may not be able to tell that much that the pressure is greater. If you go into a really deep diving pool and you go down to the bottom, you can probably tell that the pressure is greater. You've all heard about the bends? nitrogen, narcosis, or whatever, right? So the bends are because if you dive out in the ocean pretty deep, because the air pressure, I mean the water pressure is higher, what that does is it forces more, the air that you're like, breathing in from your scuba tank or whatever, uh, if it's normal air, what happens is more of the nitrogen in that air gets dissolved into your bloodstream because of the fact that the pressure is greater. So then if you come up from being down there too quickly, what happens is as the pressure eases off, your blood starts to fizz, just like a, a Coke bottle that you have just opened. Like you shake it up and then you open it, how it fizzes. And so those, those air bubbles then end up giving you seizures and stuff like that, or they can kill you, right? Because one of the air bubbles goes into and... Yeah, you can end up... Uh, suffering a whole bunch and or dying as credit to you, right? So that is a, an example of where we would experience the effects of the pressure. Okay, so pressure is the ratio of force to the area over which that force is distributed. So an example of this is if you were to have a 120 pound woman step on your bare foot with stiletto heels or a 200 pound guy step on your foot with sneakers. What's your choice? Sneakers. Sneakers. So intuitively you know what pressure is about, right? So even though the woman is lighter, what happens is because the stiletto heel has a very small surface area, she might very well puncture your foot, right? If she were to put the heel down on it. So moral of the story is don't make any woman who's wearing stiletto heels mad at you. Yes? Okay, so illustration of pressure. Now this is one of the, the reasons why traditionally, uh, at least in the past, the gangplanks, the gangways, right? Like cruise ship, whatever, and they had these uh, gangways or gangplanks or whatever it's called. They used to ask women not to wear still little heels and so forth when they were going up onto the ship. That's not as much of an issue nowadays because I think the planks are, are stronger, but they do ask uh, people to take, I don't know if you have to take all of your shoes off, like a, a plane, if a plane were to crash into water, right, and then they're going to put the rafts out, like they put the, uh, you know, 
the slides that then become a raft. They ask you to take your shoes off. I know specifically if you're wearing high heels, you have to take your shoes off. I don't remember if you have to take your shoes off if you're wearing uh, sneakers. And again, the reason is because if you're wearing high heels or something like that, the as you slide down, the heels could get caught and tear the raft, tear, tear the uh, the slide open. Right? Again, that's an illustration of pressure. Okay, so pressure is force divided by area. The force, in the case of a man with sneakers or a woman with stiletto heels or whatever, it's going to be the weight divided by the area over which that weight is operational. So because with stiletto heels, the area is much smaller, this number becomes smaller, which means the pressure is higher for a given weight. Right? So liquid pressure, which is the pressure due to the liquid above us, if you were to go and swim at the bottom of this lake, will be the weight density of the liquid multiplied by the depth. So instead of weight, now it becomes the weight density multiplied by the depth from here to the surface of the lake. So in an example like this, let's say that you've got a very small pond, not a lot of water, but it's pretty deep. You've got a really huge lake, but it's shallow. Which of these is going to have, needs a stronger dam to hold the water in? The small pond. Now that seems counterintuitive. You would think that to hold back the substantially larger amount of water, you'd need a thicker, right, stronger wall, thicker at the base, but that's not the case. To a first approximation, right? With a small deep pond, what happens is you do need a bigger base, a stronger wall, because the fact that the pressure here is proportional to the height, the amount of water doesn't make any difference to the pressure. Now there's one exception to this. The exception to this is if you end up with wind pressure or stuff like that, wind on the water that's pushing the water, or if you have water that's incoming, right, a pressure surge due to incoming water into the lake, then that is more of an issue there than here. But to a first approximation, what this slide is saying is correct. Okay, so we've seen liquid pressure is weight density multiplied by depth. So the next time you happen to be at McDonald's or Burger King or Wendy's or whatever, if you take one of the styrofoam cups, right, fill it full of pop, make three holes like this. Now, don't do this experiment. Sorry? You were going to do it? Okay. So, make three holes like this. You pro you As you would expect, what happens is the water or the coke or whatever from the top hole does not travel as far away from the base of the cup. The deepest hole spurts out the liquid to a greater distance, right? And the reason for that is because the pressure here is proportional to the height from here to there. So the pressure here is greater than the pressure here. The pressure here is just proportional to the height from here to here. Now, in a situation like this, <coughs> let's say we have a glass vessel or something of the sort, which of these three has the greatest amount of liquid above it? A, B, C, or D? Okay, let's say B has the greatest amount of fluid above, right? So based on the weight of all this fluid, you'd think that the pressure should be the greatest at the bottom here. Correct? Intuitively, that's what I would think. Pressure should be the greatest here, maybe here too, and this may be the third, and that would be the least pressure. But based on what we're seeing here from physics, it turns out that the pressure at the bottom is not proportional to the amount of water. It's proportional purely to the height of the water above it. They're all equal. And the way you tell that they have to be equal is if the pressure is greater here, what will happen is the weight of this water, if the pressure were lower here and greater here, this increased pressure here would push the water down until the pressure is equalized. Right? And the fact that it's not being pushed down is an indication that the pressure are the same. Introducing the con... Yes, sir? What about, like, that's pressure inside the water. What about, like, pressure on, on like, the base that it's in? If it's mm -hmm. if it is graduated, yes. there would be more pressure on it that way than if it was. Yes. Okay. Yeah. In the sense, it's not that there's more pressure. There's more integrated force, total force, on the side walls. Okay. Right. Extra credit to you. But the pressure would be the same, just purely a function of height. Okay. So introducing the concept of buoyancy, you probably all experienced this. Like when you get 
have you noticed, let's say this is a swimming pool and you're diving down to the bottom of the pool. Is it easier for you to float near the top or is it easier for you to stay at the bottom of the pool? Float. Float, right? Yeah. When you're at the bottom of the pool, what happens? Yep, there seems to be a force that's pushing you upwards, right? That's yeah. trying to get you out of the pool. Well, unless you blow out the Yes, air. it gets easier if you blow out as much of the air. But even if you do, typically... Well, no, you Sorry? You said which in case you die, but you don't. You can sit down there for a moment after you blow out your air, and you can kind of just hang down there. That's true, for a bit. Now, what, ha what that force, the force that's pushing you up towards the surface is called the buoyant force. That phenomenon is called buoyancy. So here's Mr. Potato Head, right? He's floating out in the middle of the ocean. I have no idea what he's doing out in the middle of the ocean, right? Probably had a tiff with his family and decided to run away. So, Potato Head off in the middle of the ocean. Now he's under, partly under the water, right? He's at a certain depth beneath the water. What happens is the pressure at any point is proportional to the height of the water above that point. So pressure at this point is proportional to the height from here to here. Pressure at this point is equal to the height of the water from here to the top. This is why the pressure, which is represented by the arrow, is greater here than there, right? So at each of these points, the pressure results in a force that is directed normal, perpendicular to the surface of the potato. That's why each of these arrows is perpendicular to the surface of the arrow. Now, the pressure from this side is equal to and cancelled by the pressure from this side. Now, pressure pushing down here is lower than the pressure pushing up. So, there's a net force in the potato, which is this force upwards minus this force downwards. You can see this arrow is smaller, therefore there's a net force pushing it upwards. That is the buoyant force. You can actually measure this in a laboratory where, let's say here is a beaker full of water. You have a piece of iron that is on scales. So as you lift up the scales, you get the weight of the iron. So let's say that this is three newtons. And you have a pan that's empty here. And you've got the, the dial on the scales calibrated so that reads zero newtons. Now, what you do is you immerse the piece of metal into the water. A certain amount of water is displaced, right? So the volume of this water is equal to the volume of that iron nugget or whatever it is. Now, you can weigh the water. So let's say that the water weighs two newtons, right? So the zero newtons, once you put the water in here, you get the weight of two newtons that weight of displaced water then results in an upward force on the iron which is equal to the weight of the displaced water. So the iron which was originally 3 newtons in weight now has an effective weight of 3 newtons minus the 2 newtons which was the displaced water. So 3 newtons downwards minus the buoyant force which is 2 newtons gives me 1 newton. This is why the water, right? This is why the iron actually w seems to weigh less in the water. This is the reason why when you are in the pool, you will feel lighter. This is also the reason why there is water aerobics and stuff like that that helps people who are like maybe senior citizens or overweight or whatever, right? It helps support the weight and... Okay. Oh, there. Okay. The buoyant force... The buoyant force by definition is the net upward force that the fluid exerts on the immersed object. So object is immersed, there's a net force upwards, that is the buoyant force. Okay, introducing Archimedes principle. The principle is basically that an immersed body is buoyed up by a force equal to the weight of the fluid that it displaces. So if it displaces one kilogram mass of water, Right? So when I get into the swimming pool, if I get into the swimming pool and if I am completely immersed, let's say that I have no idea what the volume of my body is. 10 gallons, no idea. 15 gallons, let's say 15 gallons. So I'm completely under the water. What happens is my body displaces, right? It displaces 15 gallons of water. So if you take that 15 gallons of water and you weigh it, you end up with a certain weight. 
that weight is what gives us the buoyant force on my body pushing me up out of the water. That's basically what the principle states. So it's buoyed, buoyed up by the force equal to the weight of the fluid it displaces. So if I had a big cube of iron and if I were to just drop it into the ocean, it would just sink to the bottom. Now I take exactly the same iron and I make it into the shape of a boat or a ship and I put it on the water, it floats. Why? The same thing that sank here is now floating. What changed? Opening based on the <coughs> sorry okay area Th think of the uh, principle above it what is the change from a physics perspective extra credit to both of you for speaking up something changed so think of your average ship think of a, a cruise ship the displacement of the weight is greater or larger the displacement of the weight what is it displacing Water. the area or the water. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's displacing water. Extra credit to you and to you for speaking up, right? So, what happens is, by changing the shape, the volume from here, right, if you extend it, the amount of water displaced in this case is equal to this area multiplied by the depth in this direction. So that volume is greater than this volume. So the amount of water that's displaced by this shape, the ship shape iron, is greater than the volume of water that's displaced by the block shaped iron. So you've increased the displaced water, which means the weight of the displaced water is greater in this case, sufficient to create a buoyant force which is equal to the weight of the iron. So in this case, notice, the weight of the iron is exactly the same whether irrespective of the shape of the iron. Here's a cube of iron, you convert it into the boat, so you notice that this downward arrow is exactly the same size. So downward force is exactly the same in both cases, but what changed was the displaced water is less here, so it's a smaller upward force. Now the displaced water is much larger, so there's a larger force. So you take a ship and put it in water, it'll sink all the way until the displaced water has a weight equal to the weight of the ship. That's why you take a ship, you've probably seen a ship that, pictures of ships maybe, that you load it full of cargo and the ship is, is deeper in the water, you remove all the cargo and it floats higher up, right? So here's an illustration of this. Like in your swimming pool, you take your canoe, put it in your swimming pool and you get your hippo, right? So in this case, canoe floating in the water displaces this much water, which means the displaced water, this amount, the weight of that water is equal to the weight of the entire boat, right? Now you get your pit, pet hippopotamus and put it in the canoe together with a feather pillow and the weight of the pillow and the hippopotamus cause a greater, cause the canoe to sink deeper, right? So notice that there's much more water displaced. So the total water displaced has a weight that's now equal to that of the boat plus the feather pillow plus the hippopotamus. That's why it's sinking deeper. Now if there is a hole in the boat, what happens? Mm -hmm. Extra credit. So, if there's a hole in the boat, water comes in, and so the displaced water is lower. Because the water gets in here, and the water that's displaced is now merely the, the volume of the shell of the boat, rather than the whole entire volume of the boat itself, and the thing sink, sinks. Which is kind of what happened to the Titanic, as you're probably aware. Okay, difference between floating versus immersed. Okay, here's a situation where you have uh, weighing scales, scales, you have the beaker of water, now you put a block of wood in, on the beaker, water is displaced, right? And the block sinks to a certain depth until the volume of displaced water is equal to the weight. Rather, the weight of the displaced water is equal to the weight of the block and then the block is able to float. So, that's the situation here. The floating object displaces a weight of fluid equal to its own weight. So notice that if this is 3 newtons, it is 3 newtons here too. Because you've just removed, you've added the weight of the block, but you've removed the weight of water that got displaced. So this weight remains the same. In the case where it's displaced, the situation is different. When it is displaced, you can see, rather not displaced, when the object is completely immersed versus floating. When the object is floating, the weight of the displaced water is equal to the weight of the object. 
when the object is completely immersed, the weight of the displaced water is not equal to the weight of the object. Do you guys see the difference? This is a key difference between floating and not. If the object is going to float, the upward force of it should, from the water should be equal to the weight of the object. If the object is going to sink, obviously the upward force is not equal. Right? You put the block of iron into the water and it sinks, that means the upward force due to the water is not equal to the weight of the block of iron. So that is the situation here. If it completely gets if it gets completely immersed and it sinks to the bottom, this tells us that the displaced water's weight is not equal to that of the block. However, if you put the block and it floats, then the displaced liquid's weight is equal to the weight of the object. Can you think of a liquid where if I were to take a block of iron and put it in the liquid, it would float? Sorry? Good job, extra credit. So very likely mercury, I don't I'd have to look up its densities. But um, mercury is 80 on the periodic table. It's like way down there, right? So if you look down here, mercury is 80, and iron is way up here. So iron, at least per atom, is lighter than the mercury. That doesn't necessarily always mean that the liquid mercury, right? Do you see that the mercury is here? Mercury's uh, uh, chemical symbol is Hg, because the, because mercury starts with an H and ends with a G, right? Uh, Iron, on the other hand, is Fe, right? Okay, glad to see a couple of students were awake. Uh, so, principle of flotation states that a floating object displaces a weight of fluid equal to its own weight, which is what this slide is about. Okay, introducing another principle, Pascal's principle states, right at the very top, Pascal's principle states that the pressure applied to a motionless fluid that's contained in a container is transmitted undiminished throughout the fluid. What does it mean? It means that if I apply a certain pressure here, the same pressure gets translated throughout. So whatever pressure I apply at this height has to be equal to the pressure here. This is the principle be be behind hydraulic pistons. So if you take your car into the shop to be repaired, right, they put it on this, you drive onto these tracks and this is like a single pedestal at the bottom a lot of the times, like here and they press a little button and what happens is the entire car lifts up yes so in a situation like that basically you could apply have an air compressor that applies a certain pressure on the top of a reservoir that pressure gets converted translated through here to lift the car up so situation like that here where there's a piston here's a liquid here's a larger piston larger cross section area same liquid I can apply a small weight 10 kilograms on this small area which creates a certain pressure the same pressure is translated to here because remember the pressure is proportional to the height of the liquid so the same pressure is translated here since this cross-sectional area is larger the pressure is the same so the force that's applied will be the pressure multiplied by the area so large area same pressure as here you end up with a much larger force and so this 10 kilogram mass is able to balance out hold up a 500 kilogram mass through this principle right okay introducing still continuing with liquids this entire chapter is about liquids so we're looking at different manifestations phenomena so forth associated with liquids introducing the concept of surface tension you have probably all seen this a flower, a rose, whatever, the dew on the on the rose, right? And it, it balls up into tiny little balls of liquid rather than completely wetting the rose. And the reason why it does this is because of surface tension. Surface tension is the tendency of the surface of a liquid to contract, to become smaller in area, to behave like a stretched elastic membrane. It's surface tension that causes this. If this droplet were to spread, if I were to take don't do this experiment, but I've done this as a kid. Um, that might explain a few things. Uh, <coughs> my mom is a doctor. One of those times, uh, playing with one of her mercury thermometers, thermometer broke, mercury on the floor, right? So when the mercury falls on the floor, what happens is then, like at home, uh, my parents had mosaic tiling. And so the droplets that fell on the mosaic tiling splattered in different directions and every one of them tended to form a perfect little sphere they didn't wet right they didn't go and make a flat surface 
So if you pour water on the surface, let's say that it were to create little blobs, little circular spheres versus completely wetting the surface. If, remember that we talked about the elephant versus the snake versus a sheet of paper, which same, let's say same mass of material, which has the smallest surface area? An elephant sized elephant, an elephant volumed snake, or an, or an elephant volumed sheet of paper. So you take an elephant and convert it into a sheet of paper, take an elephant and roll it and make it into a long snake. Which has the greatest surface area? Greatest. Sheet of paper. The second greatest? Snake. And the least? The elephant. Now what can I do to the elephant to make its surface area even smaller? Yep. Extra credit to all of you spoke up, right? You roll, take the elephant and you roll it into a perfect sphere. And that's the shape that has the smallest surface area for a given volume, right? <coughs> okay, cool. So this water droplet, what it's trying to do is it's trying to make a perfect sphere to reduce the surface area because of the phenomenon of surface tension. So the only thing that's keeping it from making the perfect sphere is the fact that gravity is pulling down on it and squishing it against the floor, or in this case the pedal, right? Surface tension does, is <clears throat> related to this phenomenon as well, like when you were in first or second grade and you were painting a watercolor, right? You dipped your brush into the, into the water and the, the bristles opened out. You pull the brush out of the water, what happens, right? They all get sucked together like this. What's happening is, the water is coating each of these bristles and in, let's say, think of my fingers, right? There's a sh uh, there's a, let's say that there's a sheet of water around each of these fingers that has a large surface area. Now that water that's in, connected at the top here, if it were to pull my fingers together, can form a larger blob. So this then pulls this one to form a larger blob. And by heading towards the shape of a sphere, the water as a whole is reducing its surface area and it wants to do that. And that is the phenomenon, again, related to surface tension, that's causing this behavior of the brush. Okay, related to surface tension is this phenomenon of capillarity. The rise of a liquid in a fine hollow tube or in a narrow space. Okay, let's look at what causes surface tension. What causes surface tension is, so here's a liquid, let's say this is water. Every molecule of water is attracted to every other molecule of water, right? There's a force that's drawing them together. So if you think of the students in this class, right? Let's say that each of you is experiencing an attraction to, towards all the other students, right? So every student in this class is applying an attraction on each person. So with Samantha here, what's happening is you're being pulled in that direction, this direction, this direction, this direction, this direction, right? And let's say that each of those individuals is applying a certain force on you. In what direction are you likely to move? Yep, extra credit. You're likely to move in that direction towards the center of this blob of water, right? And you're likely to move radially in where each of you, right, is likely to move in towards the center. 